Welcome to the Designated Drinker Show, the podcast that's raising the bar on craft cocktails. I am your host, Louise Sullis, and with me is my very, very talented friend who makes me a better person, the Mixtress DC Gina. Hey, Louise. How are you? I'm good. How about you? I am good. A little uh, ready for a cocktail conversation. It's perfect for um, to happen right here at Last Call, then. Yep. So we are perfectly placed. So today, Gina, I'm going to break format of the show, if you don't mind, because I think um, we just want to skip directly to our guest. I think we have um, some big conversation that's about to happen. So I'd want to jump right into the show. She's an amazing guest and um, she is going, is she somebody who can help create a space that allows us to cut through the clutter through the chase, ask some tough questions, and hopefully um, help us all walk away with a greater understanding of our fellow man, which we can only hope can make for a better world. So please let me just go straight into it and introduce today's designated drinker. She is the president of XNPR and the co-founder of Unmute. She is Zena Island. Welcome to the show, Zena. Hello. Welcome. I'm glad to be here. I'm excited. Great. Awesome. Awesome. So we have so much to talk about, but first let's do a little level setting. Please tell our listeners what is Unmuted and what was its catalyst? So Unmute started because of the Women's March. So uh, when the Women's March happened and then the big fallout between black women and white women, and it was publicly, it was on the media everywhere. And I got this idea. I was like, why isn't we all, why can't we all, you know, work together, be able to host this. And it was such a wonderful march. And uh, it's just, and, it, and it's historical. Let me say this. This is historical um, yes. where there's always, when we come together and then there's always something that splits us apart. And this goes all the way back to another famous women's march, I believe back in the, it was like around, ni- around 1920. Um, wow. And it was where black women split off because they were, you know, they were both fighting for voting rights and other equal opportunity. And it was actually the, Del- I'm an AKA and I'm going to say this because I'm an alpha Kappa alpha I'm from that sorority, <laughs> but Delta Sigma Theta led that March and they broke off from the woman for that particular woman's March, which I can, um, I think it's called the women's um, suffrage March. That's the one women's suffrage March. And yeah. they broke off and did their own thing. So um, I thought about that and I went to Emily Brzezowski, who is my co-founder. And I said, you know, it would be great. We can do something for the black woman in the tech eco space that we're both holding right now together because we both were working in it and have these um, discussions. And Emily was already having some of these discussions. Now on the race level is more so on the woman's level. Um, called Woman um, Tech Campaign. And I said, well, why can't we take what you're doing, um, some of the work I've been doing in PR, and bring it all together? And we came up with Unmute. I think it's it's perfectly uh, titled. I think it's great. Um, but and then that beyond that, the work you're doing is, uh, it's so difficult. Um, I can only imagine trying to open up those conversations um, when they're so deep-seated and to, um, and difficult. They're just difficult to have. Um, tell our, tell our listeners a little bit about what those, how those, what do those conversations sound like? How do you start having these difficult conversations? So before COVID, we had these conversations in person and we had them in Washington, DC. We also had them in New York. And um, we will bring, we will actually curate the room. We will bring people together. Um, so we wanted to make sure there were just as many white voices as there were black voices in the in that space, black and brown voices in that space. And there was a, a basically a, a a breaker activity. We did like a Emily and I would start off with a conversation. Now, mind you. We did a very light conversation on race prior to George Floyd. So, and we wanted to have a discussion where people can handle it and it was manageable. So we would talk about race from our perspective, especially how I grew up 
And then they will break and do after the uh, after that, they will break into sessions, um, have these conversations amongst each other, like in pairs of twos and threes. And then there was an art, like an art part to it. And it's hard to describe with Play-Doh, sometimes with beads to help people see how what their world and what their environment is. And sometimes you'll, you know, a lot of white people will see that most of their world was white. And, and it was played out right there with the beads or it was played out with the Play-Doh. And, you know, we will have these reflections at the end and most of it would come from white women and what they saw and how they will want to try and do better uh, and make changes, especially those who thought they were already doing something. Interesting. And then from there, we had them in the workplace, which ended up um, on Zoom uh, after George Floyd. So those can either look like one-on-one discussions with each employee and then bring everybody together and have those discussions together. And Emily and I would see the thread and to try to bring, and then we use that same type of activity. We've also have taken figures. Um, We just had one on Simone Biles. Uh, Believe it or not, that was very racially divided. Really? And we had a a discussion on that. And then another one we did on critical race theory. That was hot sauce. (laughs) I would imagine that would have been. That was hot sauce. I would imagine that would be. It was. So, Zena, back off for a second, because as people are going to listen to this podcast and they're going to be like myself, right? Where you think you understand what critical race theory is and then you then you don't. So in your words, can you def- tell us to define it? Not what I read on the Internet. What define it? That's a great question. And I'm probably not going to answer it the way I probably should be answering it. But the best, best thing is to say it's basically a study on black history in this country. So the study of racism, the study of white and black relations, the study of the Civil War, all of that is more. And it started at the law school level. That's where it all started. And then graduate studies started taking hold to it in colleges. So it was an elective. You decided if you wanted to take that course. So somehow or another, this landed and this whole issue landed in the K through 12, which I'm not quite sure how it landed there because I know I wasn't taught black history when I was in in school. And I think it's a political hot button, in my opinion, that that it's a tool that's being used to get ready for the 2022 elections. That is what I believe why all of a sudden this landed. Also, the New York Times um, 1619 project, uh, when that when that was released and then eventually schools started talking about when well, maybe we should bring this in as a curriculum, that kind of led to a discussion around critical race theory. And um, also George Floyd was being discussed in some of the classrooms around the country about what happened because the students wanted to know about it. And I think a combination of all of this, what was going on, just led to where we are now today that the conservatives have gotten a hold of it and it's being used as a political tool. It's, it's wrong. It's a heavy it's topic. Just wrong. I mean, I think all history is important. First of all, it's important, but it's, it's wrong to use it that way, especially through children. So, so it's- right. And it's not teaching your children to be shameful or hate themselves about the, their history or it's, it's not, it's really to help people understand race relations in this country right. um, and why we are where we are today. And it's just got, ugh. it's just been I don't, it's so misused. And so it's so much dis- disinformation. That's the best word. It's so much disinformation around it. Zena, I, I have to say I work in a, in a bar. Right. And there's always a conversation and it's always a heated um, situation sometimes, especially when alcohol is involved. I'm in Washington, D.C. Conversations happen bigger than maybe your normal banter in um, uh, even New York City. Okay, even New York City, Mm -hmm. because I'm from New York and I'm from I'm like literally from Long Island, one line over from Jamaica, Queens and this conversation, it seems 
very far from what I understood growing up as a kid, right? I very mixed my school. I, we were, if we were 50-50, I'm lying. It was, it was more, right? More, uh, more black community and Latina than it was white. So it's hard to, st- to stomach and listen to some of the way people speak to each other about this. And I, and I think that's how we wound up having you as a guest. Because I, I feel like people don't understand basic terms, critical race theory, um, systemic racism. Somebody told me they're systemically racist. And I said, you can't be that because the system is racist. And they don't understand how to define that. And I feel like very simple definitions could help most people understand what it means or what you're trying to say and how to communicate in a thoughtful manner instead of just blurting out facts that you might have heard, I don't know, Fox 5 or NBC or CNN. I don't care. Any news outlet. But that's just an opinion of somebody else. Right. Exactly. And let me say this. Um, There's a book, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my background for in a second. There's a book by Amber Cabral, and she break and she it's 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 her first book and she is a uh, DEI diversity equity inclusion specialist and she breaks down everything you just said systemic racism structural racism what does all of this mean um, critical race theory she breaks it down as, and by definitions and it's not a it's not a it's not a like a, a t- three hundred page book. It's a very short book, and it's a great manual. And I really recommend anybody to read that. So to help you get through and understand what do all of these um, phrases mean. Um, as far as for me, I grew up in a suburb of Detroit called Southfield. Um, at that particular time, was majority Jewish, and I grew up in a bubble. Um, I say fortunately and unfortunately. Um, fortunately because my, and I was, I started there in the fourth grade. So most of my friends were majority white and Jewish. Um, they were also very inclusive. I was invited to their bat mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs. I was invited to their homes. I played with them. They came over to my house. Um, it, it, I just had a very, um, (laughs) unusual background. I didn't realize it until much older in my age, how that impacted me. And um, my mother told me before I left for University of Michigan, she said to me, your world is getting ready to change, is not going to be the way it is, and white people are not going to accept you once you get to college. And I thought she was crazy. I thought she was insane. And I get to college and we had a racial incident that happened at the University of Michigan in 87, I believe. Um, 86, it was around 87, 88 was my sophomore year. That shook my world. I couldn't believe it. And it changed the trajectory of U of M, um, Michigan. That's what we call U of M in case you Marylanders are here listening. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, Um, We're we're the first U of M and the real one. Sorry. I have to say that. And now, now, uh, girls. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why University of Michigan started having this diversity initiative to bring in more black and brown people into the university because of what happened on campus. And then we end up in court and I'm not going to get into it, but Supreme Court ruling and and then everything had to come to a, a halt. But my point of the matter is I was never taught black history in Southfield. There was, I just remember there was one small footnote when I was learning my American history about enslaved Africans um, and where they were in, you know, in all of this. But, and it was, I would say it was probably half of a page. That's why I call it a footnote. And it kind of skipped over and went on. So where, where all these people are talking about the K to K through 12, I don't know what they're talking about because I never went through it. And you talk to a lot of other people that, you know, they'll say, I never learned black history until I, I made it an elective. Or maybe you went to a majority black school. And I, I can't speak for that in a majority black neighborhood. Maybe they learned it. But my 
white kids were not taught black history where I was. I think that that's the other thing, too, is the difference of your environment, environment in which you grow up and who's around you and you're learning it through through living it. Whereas um, in the textbooks, it was different. Like some of those things like I, I had, I, you know, I when I went to elementary school, it was uh, a majority white neighborhood. It was all white neighborhood. Um, I was one of one, I think. Uh, and we weren't taught black history, except in February. You know, I, I think about it like I learned about Harriet mm-hmm. Tubman. I, you know, like it very like high, only like the the most, you know, Rosa Parks. But again, to your point, you know, it wasn't a, a it was maybe in the month of February on one day every week. Uh, it wasn't that we dove deep into um, um, any history other than what I think a majority of us learned. But I think growing up, to your point, Gina, growing up in a neighborhood where it feels where it's more diverse, you lived a different life than maybe others, which is is a benefit. I was going to say, I'm happy. Yeah. Like, I'm happy that was my my beginning. Of course. But it's terrible. Like, I I hear all of the different conversations. And sometimes you want to say to somebody that you you don't, I don't. I, I'm I'm not black, so I can't say that I know what it feels like to be like black, right? And I don't ever s- try to say that. But what I can say is I, I wasn't um, brought up in a neighborhood where that was the issue. Like if nobody liked you, it had nothing to do with you were black or white, because like it was so fifty fifty. You know what I mean? It yeah. wasn't. It, that wasn't the issue. It's, yeah, because you wore the wrong, the wrong jeans. It's because you or... had the wrong... No, it was money <laughs> yeah. in New York. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you know what? Your segregation in New York is really big in class, whether you're rich, poor, mm. or, and how poor were you? Because I grew up in a poor neighborhood. I didn't grow up in some place that was like classy, right? And, and it was... And that's... That, that will start a bigger problem, class. Mm-hmm. But, you know, now as an adult, you can look back and you say maybe that could be linked together as well. So I, I don't know, but I, but I have two little girls and Zena, I want to make sure that my girls understand that humans are special in, them, in their own light. And they should identify the fact that like everybody is different and embrace what's different and also know the history. There's not, for me, you have to tell the history to do better. Yeah. I mean, is that right? Am I that saying the wrong so thing? That's so true. What you just said, oh my gosh. I have to snap my fingers. <laughs> no, we have to know our history in order to, to do better. That is so true. So it's important that we know and understand our history so that we all can do better. Um, so that white people can understand that, you know, when they tell us, you got to pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Well, we didn't have the straps. They took, we tried to, and they were taken away from us several times, um, either by law or through policies or redlining or segregating us. Um, you know, there was a, there was a plan to keep us segregated. As I've been reading a lot, uh, especially this book called The Color of Law, it talks about how the plan was to keep us segregated as much as possible. They didn't want the two races to come together and be integrated. They saw that that was going to be a problem. Um, So they did it in neighborhoods. They did it with education. They did it with housing. I mean, whatever they can find, they they built um, highways through when Black people did try to have their own neighborhoods and culture. They built a highway, you know, through it. I mean, you can read about it all over the country. It happened in Detroit. It happened in St. Louis. It happened in San Francisco. It happened LA. everywhere. L.A. Oh, yeah, that's right. The uh, Long Beach one, the Long Beach Highway, the yep. 301. Yep. yep. I'm very familiar yep. with that. I used to go to California a lot. <laughs> Visit. <laughs> yeah, and when I read about the 301, what went right through. And also the Santa Monica, another one. Um, yep. Or is the Santa Monica the same as the 301? I don't know. I get confused when I'm out there. <laughs> I know, me too. But they were both because the other built, thing is somebody somebody's always else's driving, right? <laughs> and I was I was young too. They were both built to go through thriving black neighborhoods, and I ended it. So and it, Hispanic neighborhoods as well, definitely. Mm-hmm. And so people yep. learned about a lot of this 
they will have a better understanding, you know, of what's happening today. I think when we talk about history, too, it's not just learning the good things that people did through time. It's also talking about the bad things that people have done through time. Um, you know, when you when you talk about, oh, what I learned during black history about figures who made great contributions to our world. But also we do skim over a lot. I mean, total. It, it, it's not n none of what we were just talking about is ever in a book when you're in elementary school, you know, they're not talking about the crimes that are done against people or right. how, to your point, policies have been made in order to make sure that things were left unequal and the ground was not level. Absolutely. To your point, knowing the history and knowing these things helps us understand the challenges of each other. How do we, what do we do as individuals? This is what Emily and I try to talk about when we come together and have these conversations is allyship. We need to become better allies. And so that once more white people learn about the struggles of black and brown Americans here in this country um, to join together and become allies and work together to, and, it, and it, I'm not trying to tell you to go out there and you know change the world, but if you, even with just what's on mute, what Emily and I are not trying to change everything, but it's just our little bit. And I think everybody's little part can make a difference. Everybody just plays a part in making a difference. And I'm going to tell you, oh, Emily is a, a Jewish woman. Um, she's a millennial. I'm black and <laughs> I'm a Gen, Gen X. So two people cannot be any more different, but she and I have so much in common and we talk about it and, and certain things that she may not understand. And I explained to her from my point of view, and then she brings her point of view. We just had a discussion about an article where she looked at it from a completely different perspective than I did. And we had a healthy discussion. And those are the things we try to bring into our discussion so people can see it because she understands it from her point of view. And then I understand it from mine. And we try to, you know, come somewhere in the middle. Dean, I have a question. Do you ever watch The Real Housewives? <laughs> no, I'm going to ask this question. Seriously, do you? Sometimes I do. Sometimes. Sometimes. So there is a um, new episode from The New York Real Housewives. I've been hearing about that one. Tell me a little bit about it because people are telling me I need to watch the New York one. You you need to watch it. And I know so somebody, I know Bershawn. I know Bershawn Shaw very well. Is that the one with Bershawn? Oh, okay, so yeah, so they're talking about doing the Black Sabbath, right? So I'm talking about how they have um, the Jewish culture come together uh, with a uh, Black community to talk about struggles and like humanity. They have on some of the housewives and you see them crumble because they don't know how to have the conversation. They can't say the words, They can't, and they can't understand the Jewish culture, the black community, the culture within the black community, wh why the two to be together when you're not Jewish to have a Sabbath together and what Sabbath actually means. And it's right there. Do you want to know what America is? It's, it's this episode. And I think that episode, as sad as it is to watch, um, really defines what white privilege looks like at, at a round table. And maybe that's a great tool. And I bet you in a million years when they were filming that show, they never thought that that's what was going to happen. But it's a defining moment because everything that you might have thought of, I don't know what white privilege is or how people talk about it, or it, it's all right there because it's a very affluent um, black woman. She doesn't need money. None of those people there were in an economic situation. It was about a discussion, a bigger secular um, discussion. And they couldn't even have the discussion because they just broke down. And it was amazing to watch hmm. because like, people that can't um, wrap their head around what, what this means, just watch this episode because you can't see it coming. And then all of a sudden it's like a brick wall. There it is. You are divided. You can't have the conversations. And you know what? Maybe you are a racist and you didn't even know it. I didn't even know it. And that's crazy. 
That's the craziest part. And how do you end that? For me, racism is based on ignorance. And then somebody else said, um, and I got, once again, I can't take credit for this. Um, this is another radio host who said this. Racism is about power. Who has the power? Mm. So mm-hmm. privilege, power, ignorance, all of that is wrapped into it. And, um, and br- you know what? That would have been a great time for them to have that discussion and try to get past it. Or, and I didn't see the episode. I have to watch it because you said everything, everybody just broke down. Um, but it was great. <laughs> I, I, w- I have to check that out. I made some of my girlfriends watch it because I have a new litmus test for are you a racist? And I have no time for people that are just can't understand that maybe you have a problem. So I have this lovely woman that works for me. Her name is Amy. And um, she said to me, because I, I had moved to... Um, Maryland, out of Maryland, and I have a farm now. I have chickens and ducks and blah, blah, blah. Nice. And she's like, she's like, she's like oh, I'm going to bring my family out. And then, and then everyone in your town is going to be like, oh, the black people are here. And I started laughing. I'm like, Amy, it's Maryland. You know, it's not like that. She's like, I grew up in Maryland. She's like, it's definitely like that. And I was like, Amy, it's not. She's like, for you, it's not. She's like, because I can see that you don't ever, that's not really the issue. She's like, but it is for others. And I go, she goes, ask somebody, where do the black families live in your neighborhood? I was like, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. So I asked and I got an answer I was floored by. They're like, oh, there's a family that lives down this street, around this corner, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, where do the heroin addicts live? And nobody can answer that question. Meanwhile, where I live, heroin is a big problem. So... That's my new litmus test. Why would you know that? Because I don't know that. As a matter of fact, I don't know where anybody lives and I don't really care. Right? Do you know what I mean? Like, that's not what my thing is. I know my neighbors are around me. And like, I would never know who lived down the block or lives around the corner or I don't know. And I, and I asked one of my friends in New York when I was home. Well, I live in Maryland. That's my home but I was in New York visiting my family. And I asked my sister the very same question. I said, hey, to my sister Luann, I was like, do you know where any black families live in the neighborhood? And she's like, what the hell are you talking about? She's like, I gotta finish doing this, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, she's like, I don't know where anybody lives. And that's when I knew she, we were brought up in the same environment. It doesn't matter. But you knew in another location and now it's like, my eyes are like this, like, oh my God. People really live this. Yeah. And these aren't, these aren't old, these aren't like old people like you'd say they were brought up in a different time. It's they're 80 years old. It's never gonna change. These, these are people that are 35. These are these are young people with young families. So you're just teaching the next thing. The next generation. Exactly. Yeah. Next generation, next yeah. thing. Yeah, next kid. Yeah. I hate my kids sometimes. So. <laughs> <laughs> She said the next. I'm just kidding. If you ever hear the show, girls, I do love you. Mommy doesn't. <laughs> mommy calls everything a thing. Sorry. <laughs> I love it. Thing one, thing two. <laughs> Literally, sometimes I call them that. I'm like, where are the things? I... That's okay. I call the dog beasts. But so. do you find that? That's a good question. Um, I don't. I can't. I can't really answer that question because I've never really asked. Um. But that's a, that. That would have been a question for Emily. She would have been able to ask that, answer that one. But for me, in terms of um, neighborhoods, let me say this: I live in Arlington. It's majority white neighborhood. Um, I picked this neighborhood to be really honest with you because it was close to DC. I moved here from Detroit, and any of you all know by Detroit, Louise does. Um, I was looking <laughs> at the fact that I'm not moving to Maryland because it takes too long on the road and all that traffic and there's not enough highways here and I <laughs> I need to get to where I need to go quickly and I don't have time to sit in traffic. So I picked Virginia, <laughs> not knowing the history. <laughs> now, mind you, I didn't know the history of Virginia, okay? 
So I came here very ignorant and very green. You know, just I just because black people are asking me. You went to hot sauce, me. right? I, right. <laughs> black people are asking me. You live in hot sauce. I live in hot sauce daily, and black people are asking me why in the world are you living in Virginia? And I couldn't answer the question. And I remember I would get lost, and I would stop folks in D.C., black people in D.C., and I was like, how do I get to Arlington? So one black man said to me, he's an older, but I never forget this for the rest of my life. He said to me, ma'am, I don't know anything about Virginia. I don't go in there, but I can tell you it's across the river. That's all he, he pointed across the Potomac River. He says over there, but I, you can't ask me anything about Virginia. So that's what made me start digging a little bit deeper about Virginia. And then I did. And also I ended up taking a project um, through the city of Alexandria um, to help them promote some of their um, African-American history around the area. And then you just dig deeper and deeper and you start learning so much to the point um, Solomon, Solomon Northrup, which was made into a movie, 12 Years a Slave. Um, there is some belief that he might have been held here or sold here to go to um, Texas based on the slave trade that happened in Alexandria. And... I connected that movie to the city of Alexandria. If you look it up, you'll see a ton of press on it because I do media, media relations. And I just started digging and digging and digging and digging. And I'll just learn so much. I said, no wonder everybody was asking me, why the heck I'm here? <laughs> you know, all these streets, Custis. <laughs> I had no idea. I was just like, whatever. You know, all the different streets, Route 1, which was, you know, Jefferson Davis, you know, everyone calls it Route One, but back then it was saying Jefferson Davis. And so it was it was very interesting. And so I felt like God put me here for a purpose uh, for me to learn um, my history. And at the same time, the way I grew up and I'm sort of bringing those two worlds together because I've been conflicted for a number of years. And also God put in my path um, civil rights leaders, like real leaders who have been on the front lines like Dorothy Height and uh, Sonia Sanchez and John Lewis. Oh, oh my gosh. And I, I met so many of them through a project with Ford Motor Company I did. And they were just um, telling me stories left and right, stuff that you won't read about. And I felt like I was at their feet learning history that I knew nothing about. And they knew that. And they were okay with it. I think they were sharing it with me, hoping that I would make a difference. Merle Evers Williams, all of those folks. And I'm so grateful and thankful. And I feel so blessed that I would have had an opportunity to meet with them, meet them and work with them. Talking with giants. That's your talking memoir. Like that. <laughs> Louise, we got to get together and talk. That's a good idea. Talking with giants. So I think uh, if you're OK with it. What do you guys think about making a cocktail? Yeah, we're going to make some cocktails. Let's do, I think we need one after this, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is so, an inclusion sangria. <laughs> love it. <laughs> we're going to rename right. it. I, yeah, I like that. I'm going to... But gonna, aren't you using are, aren't you using uh, white white wine, though? <laughs> Girl, I'm using rosé. A little oh, bit of everything. Uh, yeah, use rosé. I would be the rosé. <laughs> you got to put the rosé in it. My favorite wine. All right. Here we go. So um, sangria is like a really uh, great thing. You know, it comes from Spain, Italy, you know, uh, super delicious. Um, but here's, a, here's the rub of sangria. Everyone here likes to dump a ton of sugar in it and like brandy and blah, blah, blah. It's very traditional Spanish style. Where my family's from in Italy, it is very, very simple. You take whatever fruit you have citrus, whatever, you throw it in there and you use sweet wine and dry wine and you and you basically put um, half the amount of sweet wine as you do as dry, right? And for every time you use a bottle, you use three different citruses. So today we're gonna use um, the juice of one whole orange, right? And I'm literally gonna just squeeze it into the pitcher, right? One, two. And then we're gonna use the juice of one whole lemon. I'm gonna squeeze it in the pitcher. And I'm using my hands, and I'm going to tell you why. My father used to make this, and um, <laughs> I this is how we always did it. This is how I always make it, and that's it. That's great. And then we're going to use a lime. Now, if the lime doesn't have a lot of juice, um, you could always use another half of something else, and I'll use a little bit more lemon. I'm just going to squeeze that in. And then we're going to take some fresh peaches. Um, I love stone fruit. I think stone fruit is great. It's still in season here in um, 
in D.C. I was going to say Maryland. We are in D.C. Um, and Where gonna, are we? <laughs> and we're going to throw it in a little bit of slices, right? Nothing crazy, right? Everything's just sitting in there. Now we're going to take Vinsanto, which is an Italian um, sweet wine, and we're going to pour it in. And I took it from another bottle, so sorry, I have it in the glass. <laughs> and then we're going to take a bottle, an um, entire bottle of a dry rosé. Mm. Now, when I say dry rosé, is this is not to be made with white Zinfandel. Ugh. If you want to use white Zinfandel, I'm okay with it. Add some strawberries. <laughs> enhance the white Zinfandel. Add more lemon. Fine. If you happen to have, I happen to have these little two Italian plums, and they were just sitting around, and I just couldn't possibly waste them. Now, you can't go wrong with sangria. Adding a little bit more fruit to it is going to be fine. We're going to add that. The one thing I will tell you is, whatever you add, take out the pit. <laughs> because two things. One, sometimes you don't see them, and then you choke on them. Two, uh, the pits make it bitter. So the beauty of sangria is you can make an entire pitcher, leave it in your refrigerator, and up to seven days later, it's still good. The one sangria turns bad is when it grows mold on the top. Ooh. And I would not suggest just removing the mold and still <laughs> drinking it. Although as a, as a young bartender, I thought maybe that was okay. <laughs> Late at night after being at work all day. Well, I and the doing older the wine, friends. the better. That <laughs> turns into a serious session of being alone in your house and your stomach hurting forever. <laughs> Take it from me, folks. You don't need to go through that yourself. That's, that's a different kind of juice cleanse. Uh, yes, it's a very, well, <laughs> you know, if you want to go on a juice cleanse, it's really cheap. <laughs> Throw a bottle of wine, some fruit, and drink that later. All right, so we're going to take it all in the picture, right? All we're going to do is turn this around. Sangria can be made, like I said, up to seven days, and you can leave it inside of your refrigerator, keep it refrigerated. Do not leave it on top of your radiator that's boiling because uh, you live in a house from 1900s. And oh, that's Zena. That's a good she doesn't idea. turn on any air conditioning. The air yeah. is on today. <laughs> so that's it. We just made it. We made a whole pitcher of sangria. It's super easy. So now we're going to taste this, right? So we're at last call, and um, if you've ever been to my bar here, you know that I don't have any wine glasses. So. I'm going to use rocks glasses. And, that'll be and I'm going to pour my, my sangria while you're doing yours. <laughs> Love there it. There you go. I can join you. Absolutely. Um, I don't think mine is as great as hers. But it is. It is. But it's it, all I, sangria I is good. I the best I can do. <laughs> I'm into it. All right. So we're going to fill up some ice. And you can use cubed ice, whatever. This just happens to be closer to me. And I'm, and I'm being lazy. So sometimes I'm a little lazy. All right. And throw in a peach for uh, good, good luck. luck. Now, all the fruit that's in here, definitely eat it. Ooh, yeah. Um, that can yeah, be dangerous, Yeah, that's the best though. part to me. Ooh, yeah. That could cost you, though, if you're not careful. <laughs> that's if you put brandy in it. This is a wine... Sangria. I'm just saying it gets all full of the uh, wine and, and eat and, it and it's so good and you don't realize how much you're consuming. Yeah, and let's, and let's go through this really quick. If, when you add different liquors to the bottom, mm -hmm. you know, you turn them from sangrias to sangries and different drinks. Yes. This is sangria. Okay. Great. I'm gonna pass I can't this over wait to have some. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Screen to screen. All right. Hey, have you ever seen the Partridge Family? Yeah, and they move the things from the screen to screen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or, um, yeah, there's a Partridge family, right? There we go. Cheers. Cheers. Next time, hopefully, we can be together. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. There you go. Oh, that's so good, Gina. It's and easy. I, and it would be, and it, as it sits, it, I would imagine it even gets better, yeah? Oh, yeah. I'm going to send this home with you. I just won. So let me ask you this. When you put it in the refrigerator, Gina, is it in an airtight container? Um, just not. I made this in metal, but you want to throw it in glass or plastic. And um, because the metal will kill the um, citrus. And but it closed, right? I mean, like. I mean, as long as you're not like have all the blue cheese in there. <laughs> Some people like really have a lot of cheese in their fridge, like dairy. Yeah. And that spoils other food. Oh. So you need to be careful. What? I'll be careful. I'll be careful. Yeah, like if you have like um like moldy cheese, like good cheese, like I'm talking like gorgonzola, you know, blue, whatever you like. It has a lot of living culture. Oh, that would make sense and now that you're saying that. It can affect other things. Interesting. Never so, thought about that. You know, keep your cheese to yourself. <laughs> no, don't cut the cheese. If you if you have if you have that, put something on it, but you don't necessarily have to. Interesting. I didn't know that. Thanks. So where are they going to go get this recipe, Gina? Um, you're going to go to Designated Drinker Dot Show. Where? 
You're going to go to designateddrinker.show for some tips, tricks, how to's, candy flips. I don't know. I don't know what you do. <laughs> and, and can we put the books up? Yes, yes. Yeah. Actually, Zena, do you mind um, sharing the titles of those books? And we'll make sure we'll include that oh, in yeah, our I'll, episode I'll notes yes, along with absolutely. on the website. And the other thing we'll make sure we'll, we'll do is we'll link to your podcast as well, which we didn't even, we didn't mention. That's okay, but link to it, please. That'll be great. And it, tell our listeners where what your little podcast is. Our podcast is about, um, we're talking about marginalized uh, entrepreneurs, um, mainly mostly in dc but really all over the country and we bring them together and have them a, a discussion with them and also we may add a, a venture capitalist or angel investor to the conversation yep. is we are getting ready to change it up a bit okay based on what has happened over the past year gotcha um so we're gonna be hopefully re-recording very soon but there's still enough episodes for you to catch up are you gonna change the title the or one. can they what should they look for still st- it's called get found get funded okay and go to get found get funded.com feel free check them out yep we'll make sure especially we ha- if you want to learn about entrepreneurship and uh angel investing and vc you should check it out um, I think I know what I'm doing when we get done here. Uh, <laughs> um, so again, that'll be at designateddrinker.show, or you can even just look into the episode notes, just swipe up in your smartphone and all of these links and information will be right there for you. So you don't even have to go far. Listen, I don't know about being uh, marginalized, but I know it's like to be a woman in business. And when they well, call- That's marginal, consider marginalized. Yeah. Yeah. So they, I like when they still call, I own four places and they're like, um, is the male boss there? Uh, not unless I grew a penis this week. <laughs> no, I'm right here. <laughs> the male boss. Yeah. I'm like, who's that? Yeah. <laughs> a male boss? Who asked that? What? All the t- oh, my God. It's 2021. You know what, Zena? Lord. Invite me on your podcast. I'll tell you the best story ever about PNC Bank that mm. will blow your mind. You got an invitation. I mean, literally, you'll be like, because it's not, it's, it's the most sexist thing that ever happened. And I couldn't believe it. I, I, it, it couldn't get a loan. Yeah. You couldn't get a loan? Are you serious? Eight years of banking with, uh, with PNC Bank. Eight years. And a loan officer from Richmond, Virginia, this about a 60-year-old white male. Um, his name is whatever. I'll, I'll, I'll just clue his name. I don't care. <laughs> he literally... I went through all of the hoops. I filled out all the paperwork. I checked every box. I fit the bill to get a loan. And they're like, no, you just, you know, you're not the right person. Are you fucking kidding me? I've had my money with you for eight years. I went to Eagle Bank. I got the loan in four days. It was a construction loan for another location. Now, what was wrong with me? Let me think. You were banking at the wrong bank. Vagina. <laughs> that vagina. Now, when you and when people say that black women are literally have the hardest time at, at, out of any race, sex, everything, I 100 percent believe it. Oh, yeah. Especially in getting VC capital. If you're talking about VC capital. We get less than one percent of that money, of that funding. Um Loans, we're not even begin about get, trying to get a loan. So black women are bootstrapping their businesses along with raising children in a family and sometimes taking care of parents. So it, it's 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 tough. Um, the PPP, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure the ego, I don't I probably, I probably shouldn't get too that deep into it. But let me say this. I had to move banks in order to get a PPP loan. So I would 100% say that's true. And I, you're not the only person, and I'm not, this is not putting color or race on this one, had to move banks because people didn't, so some banks, some banks did not want to engage in the beginning for the first round of PPP because they didn't believe that the government would pay it back. And it wasn't until um, the second round of PPP that maybe your bank that you were originally with started giving the money. But you know who was it amazing? At least what I think, Sandy Spring for a local in DC. Hmm. Is that who you moved from? I moved to Main Street Bank, which was across the street from Sandy Springs. It was interesting because I thought about them, but someone referred me to Main Street Bank. Fine, that's great. But from Wells Fargo. Oh of course. So of I'm gonna course. say that you, you don't it's not your black. You have the wrong sex. 
It's fucked up. It's effed up. And now I have a banking relationship, a better banking relationship. Yep. But there were a lot of black. Let me say this. There were a, I was very fortunate to get round one. Good job. And round two. Because I talked to so many black owned business owners who did not get round one. And it was it was based on their race. And I know they 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 had I know that uh, Urban League, National Urban League had to go to the hill and fight for that. So that's why the second round came out for more black owned businesses to get it. And I think that was great. I mean, maybe the white 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 male was like completely put in another situation. But you know what? They got everything before everybody else. They did. So, okay. That money was earmarked for certain corporations. Oh, oh sure. Oh, of course look, it was. Look at the restaurant relief fund. Yeah. The people they got the the corporations billions of dollars. Are you serious? They need more money. Yeah. Now, no, the little people that employ forty people that actually make an impact on local economy needed the money. Yep. It was sad. It, you're right. It was. I want to be on podcast. <laughs> I want to talk about All it. All right. Come on. You're on. We're going to have Let's you on. It. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. All right. All right. I think it's time to wrap this one, though, Gina. And it, oh, one last gonna, question. Get the one last question. This Sorry. is a good one. We got always land on, end on a really good note. So, Zena, in this day and age, everybody has like a spiritual animal that they identify with. And you might identify yourself with the white dove that is all symbolizing peace and wants and wants everybody to be together in unity and all of that. So if you could be an ingredient to identify yourself, what would that ingredient be and why? And it does can be for cooking or for cocktails. Oh, okay. I thought you were gonna ask for an animal. So I, of course I was gonna say cocker spaniel. <laughs> <laughs> little Apache. Apache. I was like, I know why I like Cocker Spaniels now. I do get it. Um, for a drink. Uh, or, or food. Or food. Hot sauce. Because I like to keep things <laughs> spicy. <laughs> you can take it whatever way you circle. want. It. Perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> I like that answer. Perfect. All right. On that note, ladies, cheers. Here's to all that you do, Zena. Thank you very much for sharing. And thank you for having me on your show. This has been wonderful. Thank you. The Designated Drinker Show is produced by Missing Link, a podcast media company that is dedicated to connecting people to intelligent, engaging, and informative content. Also in the Missing Link lineup of podcasts is Roger That, a podcast dedicated to guiding you through the haze of dementia led by skilled caregivers Bobby and Mike Carducci. Now, if you're looking for a whole new way to enjoy the theater, check out Between Acts, an immersive audio theater podcast experience. Each episode takes you on a spellbinding journey through the works of newfound playwrights, from dramas to comedies and everything in between. Find Missing Link's League of Podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. Please Don't forget to subscribe, download, and review the shows. Your review helps our shows reach new audiences. To find out more about Missing Link, visit missinglink.company. That's missinglink.company.